time I wrote them all down. <laughs> well, that's anyway, good. Gov Governor Rick Perry said that uh, he had dinner with you recently and that you do not believe the president's birth certificate is real or not. Is the governor correct that you don't believe it? I thought that you were satisfied. I'm not a major believer. I mean, I don't know how it just miraculously appeared, and we'll see what happens, but I'm never, I've never been a major believer. All of a sudden, after years and years, it was produced out of nowhere. Some people have serious, serious doubts as to its validity, and I frankly really want to get on to much more important subjects, although that's a very important one, because if, in fact, it's not 100%, he's not supposed to be the president of this country, which is a pretty important fact. But nevertheless, I want to talk about jobs. I want to talk about the economy. I want to talk about how China and OPEC and others are ripping us off. But I'm not a fan. Uh, I, thought when, I thought last April that it was finally put to rest with you. No, no, never to rest. I, I, I'm at a point where I say, look, the country is going to hell in a handbasket, and something has to be done about it. And we shouldn't be talking about the birth certificate, but people love to talk about it. For instance, it's your first question. I guess uh, at a luncheon or at an interview, Governor Perry had mentioned that I said that I'm not a big believer, and I'm not. I mean, you know, people look at the hospital. There are no records that his mother was ever there. Uh, there are many other things that are really suspect. So, you know, out of after years of Hillary wanting it and McCain wanting it and everybody wanting it and I put the big pressure on, all of a sudden it appears, and people have real questions about the validity. Now, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about jobs. I want to talk about how to get this country great again, but I'm not a big fan. All right, well, uh, I actually, I'm, I'm convinced it's the real deal. So, well, that's uh, you good. Know, I'm that, glad you are. I, and that's okay, and some people are and some people aren't, and, you know, I'm just not as easily convinced. Okay, the other thing, uh, you're very active uh, on uh, Twitter, and uh, you uh, just tweeted recently, does Barack Obama ever work? He's constantly... The birth certificate issue is far from dead. The majority of the United States citizens are not fools, and this conspiracy of silence perpetrated by the media is hurting their credibility. The currently released birth certificate on the Internet has been analyzed by forensic experts and has been found to be a forgery. Two and a half years now. I think it started during the campaign. And My friends, it is the 27th of April, 2011. And as the headline reads, uh, the newest Obama birth certificate that's been released by the White House has been altered in literally dozens of ways. And it's been altered in ways that are so obvious that it makes the head spin. This had to have been done on purpose to accelerate this to debate. The White House obviously wants to make everything about the birth certificate and was he really from Hawaii or Kenya instead of his record of more wars, torture, bailing out banks, signing statements and lobbyists. There's no way they are this stupid. Uh, if they are this hubris filled and arrogant and crazy and have put out the document that we're about to show you then we're in even more trouble. In a way, I hope that this is some type of sick ploy. Because if they are crazy enough to put this out, knowing that there are millions of people that are Photoshop experts, including people who have degrees in it, like my sister who has a degree in photography, and two people we have on staff that are Photoshop experts. They've all looked at it. It is mind-blowing. That's only the tip of the iceberg. That's what got the Photoshop community's attention online. There are thousands of sites right now going crazy, mainline ones saying this is obviously fake. On purpose. This is a horrible fake forgery on purpose. Understand, um, someone who has no understanding of how to research forgeries would see this immediately. Right now we're reeling from this, but uh, Rob Dew, President Obama has been set up He's been caught in a sting. You know, I have studied the whole birther birth certificate story, and I've been on the fence. But the more I look at it, the more it is absolutely clear that a cover-up is going on. What are the big developments? Well, I had Jerome Corsi, investigative journalist, on my radio show today, and he said, Alex, I'm going to send you the World Net Daily article that I wrote back in February of this year where we had moles inside the Department of Health in Hawaii who told us that the birth certificate wasn't there 
But the scuttlebutt was it was going to be added and that it would then be released. Then, three weeks before Obama came out in late April and released the birth certificate, Corsi has the emails, the correspondence, all of it on record, that they came to him and said, now the birth certificate is there and they're getting ready to release it. But investigative reporter Corsi and the publisher of World Net Daily, Joseph Farah, decided to let the president take the bait, let him come out like Nixon did and lie about the plumbers not being under his control at the Watergate. They decided to let Obama come out and put his name publicly to this latest forgery. And that has now happened. And I was sent by Dr. Corsi the original uh, five drafts of the article they never published uh, in February. And he then relayed more revelations that came out since then and that they even knew when Obama was going to basically go public and release the forgery, the latest birth certificate. This is incredible information. Also, new info has come out about him using a Connecticut social security number that is not his. Now, this issue is so giant. That's why Obama has stonewalled for two and a half years, spent over $2 million with a lawyer, brought the lawyer into the White House to try to suppress this. And when they got desperate because of the publication of the book, Where is the Birth Certificate, they blinked and released this fraud that's been analyzed as a fraud. But, there is a bigger problem with Obama's qualifications. He is not a natural-born citizen by any stretch of the imagination. The Constitution establishes who qualifies to be President of the United States of America. Some say, no law, require the electors to only elect a President who meets the constitutional eligibility for office. Wrong. The Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the United States of America. It is the framework for the organization of the United States government and for the relationship of the federal government with the states, citizens, and all people within the United States. Obama and his cronies are undermining our Constitution. Every president from George Washington to George W. Bush the 43rd president of the United States qualified under the Constitution to be president except for one, Chester Arthur 1881-1885. Chester Arthur lied numerous times about his past to hide the fact that when he was born his father was not a United States citizen and to therefore obfuscate his ineligibility to hold vice presidential and presidential office. What is most telling is that Chester Arthur also burned all personal records just prior to his death. Chester Arthur was challenged during his vice presidential bid on the ground that he was not born in the United States. No one challenged Chester Arthur on the ground that even if he were born in the United States, he was still not an Article II natural-born citizen because of his father's foreign citizenship at the time of his birth which also made his mother an alien. Hence, the Chester Arthur example is not and cannot be treated as any precedent since the nation was not aware of the truth about his father's and mother's non-U.S. citizenship status at the time of his birth. What exactly are the requirements to be President of the United States? 1. Must be a natural-born U.S. citizen. Someone may be born abroad, but only if both parents were citizens of the United States. The only exception to this was for those around at the time the Constitution was adopted. Their requirement was that they had to be a citizen when the Constitution was adopted. 2. Be at least 35 years of age. 3. Have lived in the United States for at least 14 years to be president. This does not have to be consecutive or even the 14 years leading up to becoming president. Out of all the criteria, the only one in question is if someone is born abroad to two parents that are United States citizens. You're saying now give me the sources. Here they are, age and citizenship requirements. The United States Constitution, Article 2, Section 1 No person except a natural-born citizen, or a citizen of the United States, at the time of the adoption of this Constitution, shall be eligible to the office of President. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years, and been 14 years a resident within the United States. First Congress. Session 2 Chapter 3. 1790 Chapter 3, An Act to Establish and Uniform Rule of Naturalization Section 1. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, and, the children of citizens of the United States, that may be born beyond sea, or out of the limits of the United States, shall be considered as natural-born citizens, provided, that the right of citizenship shall not descend to persons whose fathers have never been resident in the United States, provided also, that no person heretofore proscribed by any state, shall be admitted a citizen as aforesaid, except by an act of the legislature of the state in which such person was proscribed. Approved.
March 26, 1790. Anyone born after July 4, 1776 in the United States to parents who became citizens of the United States as a result of the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution was born in the country to United States citizen parents was a natural-born citizen. The first Congress in the Naturalization Act of 1790 even extended the natural-born citizen status to persons born abroad to United States citizen parents. The Third Congress, through the Naturalization Act of 1795, repealed the 1790 Act and declared such children born abroad to United States citizen parents to be considered as citizens of the United States and not natural-born citizens. What about Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, and Harrison? They were not natural-born citizens. Why doesn't Obama qualify? Obama is not a first citizen of the United States. The citizens made the Constitution and their government. The Constitution and government did not make the citizens. On July 4, 1776, Americans declared independence from Great Britain. Therefore, July 4, 1776 established American citizenship. The Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, the first Constitution of the United States, which went into use in 1777 and which were formally ratified on March 1, 1781, officially recognized the nation as the United States of America. All those who helped create the new nation became its citizens. These were the first citizens of the United States, which Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5 Grandfather to be eligible to be president provided they were born before the adoption of the Constitution. All presidents born after 1787, except for Chester Arthur and Barack Obama, met the natural born citizen criteria, that is, born on United States soil to a mother and father who were themselves United States citizens at the time of the president's birth. Obama is not a natural born citizen. Obama's father was never a United States citizen nor was he an immigrant. Obama's father was here on a temporary student visa. Forty-seven Americans have served as vice president. Ten were born before 1787. All vice presidents born after 1787, except for Chester Arthur, met the natural born citizen criteria. Fourteen vice presidents have gone on to be president. The Twelfth Amendment says no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of president shall be eligible to that of vice president of the United States. Source, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5 No person except a natural-born citizen, or a citizen of the United States, at the time of the adoption of this Constitution, shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years, and been 14 years a resident within the United States. The founders and framers wrote the Constitution to protect our inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They did this by giving us a constitutional republic and providing for the survival and preservation of that republic. They provided the office of President and Commander-in-Chief, a singular and all-powerful office involving the concentration of both civilian and military power into the hands of one person. The framers recognized that this office presented great risk to the republic and its people. They gave us the Natural Born Citizen Clause as one basis for eligibility to such offices for our protection. Through the Natural Born Citizen Clause, they instructed us that power must fall into the hands of a person who can be trusted to the greatest degree possible for the survival and preservation of the Constitutional Republic. The definition of Natural Born Citizen in the Constitution was, and is extremely clear. We have followed the law for presidential eligibility from the inauguration, on April 30, 1789, a President George Washington, to George Walker Bush the 43rd President of the United States of America. Where else do we find the definition of natural-born citizen and its influence on the framers of the Constitution and founding fathers of the United States of America? Before the Constitution the closest reference we have to natural-born citizen is from the legal treatise The Law of Nations, written by Imrich Duvatel in 1758. In Book 1 Chapter 19, Section 212 Of the Citizens and Natives Error in Translation Should be naturals. The original French text is included for your reference. Referring to Vautel's work we see that natural-born citizens are those born in the country of parents who are citizens. The framers rejected the notion that the United States was under English common law. The common law of England is not the common law of these states. George Mason one of Virginia's delegates to the Constitutional Convention Vartel strongly influenced Benjamin Franklin. In 1775, he observed, the importance of the law of nations, on the founding fathers and he then ordered three copies of the latest editions. The Library Company of Philadelphia holds one of the three copies. It is important to note that Franklin ordered this copy in French. It is significant because French was considered by the family of nations to be the diplomatic language, 
and the 1775 edition was considered the most exact reference of Vautel's Law of Nations. The decision of our United States Supreme Court set a precedent and relied upon natural law and the law of nations and not the English common law to define citizenship in our society and confirmed the natural law and the law of nations definition of an Article II natural-born citizen which prevailed at the time of the founding and writing of our Constitution in 1787 a definition we can find in M. Rich Duvautel's The Law of Nations, Section 212 London 1797, First Edition New Chatel 1758. Vautel, a political philosopher, wrote The Law of Nations which the founders and framers heavily relied upon in the early years of our republic. This definition, which was incorporated into our American common law is a child born in the country to citizen parents which means a child born in the United States or its jurisdictional equivalent to a father and mother both of whom are either natural born citizens or citizens of the United States. No constitutional amendment, including the 14th Amendment, or United States Supreme Court decision, or a congressional act not to imply that any such act could ever amend it or abandon this American common law definition and it still prevails today, even being confirmed by the United States Supreme Court in United States v. Wong Kim Ark, 169 United States 649 1898. The Founding Fathers did not exclusively use the English translation, but relied upon the French original. On December 9, 1775, Franklin wrote to Vautel's editor, C.G.F. Dumas, I am much obliged by the kind present you have made us of your edition of Vautel. It came to us in good season, when the circumstances of a rising state make it necessary frequently to consult the law of nations has been continually in the hands of the members of our Congress, now sitting. Accordingly, the copy which I kept has been continually in the hands of the members of our Congress, now sitting, who are much pleased with your notes and preface, and have entertained a high and just esteem for their author. Samuel Adams in 1772 wrote, Vatel tells us plainly and without hesitation, that the Supreme Legislative cannot change the Constitution in 1773 during a debate with the colonial governor of Massachusetts. John Adams quoted Vatel that the Parliament does not have the power to change the Constitution. John Adams is so taken by the clear logic of Vautel that he wrote in his diary, the idea of Monsieur du Vautel indeed, scowling and frowning, hunted me. These arguments were what inspired the clause that dictates how the Constitution is amended. The framers left no doubt as to who had the right to amend the Constitution, the nation, that is the individual states and the people, or legislature which is the federal government. In the Federalist Papers No. 78, Alexander Hamilton also echoed Vautel and both of the Adams, when he wrote, Fundamental principle of Republican government, which admits the right of the people to alter or abolish the established Constitution, whenever they find it inconsistent with their happiness. Then in 1784 Hamilton arguing for the defense in the case of Rutgers v. Waddington extensively used Vautel, quoting prolifically from the Law of Nations. The judge James Duane in his ruling described the importance of the new republic abiding by the Law of Nations, and explained that the standard for the court would be Vautel. He ruled that the statutes passed under the color of English common law must be interpreted from the standpoint of its consistency with the law of nations. This concept of Vautel led to the creation of the judiciary branch of our government to ensure that Congress could never legislate away the provisions of the Constitution. In 1794, President Washington faced the first threat to his neutrality proclamation by the ambassador of France, citizen Edmond Charles Genet to honor their treaty and support France's wars with England and Spain. In a very rare agreement both Jefferson and Hamilton using Vautel's Law of Nations they were able to give Washington the international legitimacy not to commit the United States to war in 1793. Genet wrote to Washington, You bring forward aphorisms of Vautel, to justify or excuse infractions committed on positive treaties, case law regarding natural-born citizen. Minor versus Hapurs at 1874, at common law, with a nomenclature of which the framers of the Constitution were familiar. It was never doubted that all children born in a country, of parents who were its citizens, became themselves, upon their birth, citizens also. These were natives or natural-born citizens, as distinguished from aliens or foreigners. Some authorities go further, and include a citizen's children born within the jurisdiction, without reference to the citizenship of their parents. As to this class there have been doubts, but never as to the first. For the purposes of this case, it is not necessary to solve these doubts. It is sufficient, for everything we have now to consider, that all children, born of citizen parents, within the jurisdiction, are themselves citizens. United States v. Wong Kim Ark 1898, the court thoroughly discussed natural-born citizen, and Justice Gray quoted from Minor v. Hapurset, the case's importance is that it is the first case decided by the Supreme Court that attempts to explain the meaning of natural-born citizen under Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5 of the United States Constitution. The Holding in United States. 
versus Wong Kim Ark states that Wong Kim Ark is a native-born citizen and not natural-born. If you look at the fact of Wong Kim Ark being born in San Francisco, California, of foreign Chinese parents, therefore was not natural-born, Perkins vs. Olds 1939, importance is that it actually gives examples of what a natural-born citizen of the United States is. What a citizen of the United States is. And what is a native-born citizen of the United States. In this case, the United States Supreme Court decided the same as in prior case law that a natural-born citizen is a person who is born of two United States citizen parents and born in the mainland of United States, natural-born citizen, United States Supreme Court's relevant facts, Miss Elg was born in Brooklyn, New York, on October 2, 1907. Her parents, who were natives of Sweden, emigrated to the United States sometime prior to 1906 and her father was naturalized here in that year. In 1911, her mother took her to Sweden where she continued to reside until September 7, 1929. Her father went to Sweden in 1922 and has not since returned to the United States. In November, 1934, he made a statement before an American consul in Sweden that he had voluntarily expatriated himself for the reason that he did not desire to retain the status of an American citizen and wished to preserve his allegiance to Sweden, United States Supreme Court's holding, the court below properly recognizing the existence of an actual controversy with the defendants declared Miss Elg to be a natural-born citizen of the United States and we think that the decree should include the Secretary of State as well as the other defendants. Rationale of the logic is as follows. The United States Supreme Court in 1939 held that Elg was a natural-born citizen because she was born in Brooklyn, New York on October 2, 1907. Her father was naturalized as a United States citizen in 1906 under the Naturalization Act of 1906, and her mother derived her United States citizenship in 1907 under the Expatriation Act of 1907 federal statute as proof, and being that, Elg was born prior to the 19th Amendment, ratified on August 18, 1920, her status was still tied to that of her husband. Ms. Elg was found to be a natural-born citizen because she was born in the mainland United States of America New York of two United States citizen parents. A person can be a United States citizen under the following circumstances. 1. Person was born of one citizen parent, like Obama, or 2. Person was born in the United States mainland, anchor babies, or 3. Person was naturalized, came from another country and went through the process of becoming a United States citizen. To be a natural-born citizen the person must be born in the United States mainland of two United States citizen parents. Obama may be a citizen but not a natural-born citizen. If he was born in the state of Hawaii which has not been proven, he would be a citizen since he had one United States citizen parent. Obama is illegally holding the office of presidency and must be removed immediately. Obama, his handlers and all involved in this cover-up must be arrested immediately and tried and convicted of treason. Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 115 Section 2381, Treason, whoever, owing allegiance to the United States, levies war against them or adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort within the United States or elsewhere, is guilty of treason and shall suffer death, or shall be in prison not less than five years and fine under this title but not less than $10,000, and shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. Obama has committed numerous serious and heinous crimes while illegally holding the position of president. He must be stopped. Obama lied under oath. He swore under oath to uphold the Constitution. Yet, he has ignored our Constitution, murdered United States citizens without due process, waged numerous illegal wars, is terrorizing other countries and killing their civilians, armed the drug cartels through fast and furious and continues to turn our country into a police state. Obama has committed treason and must receive the maximum punishment for treason, the death penalty. We need to send a message to future presidents of the United States of America. If they abuse the power we allow them to have, they will suffer the consequences to liberty and freedom for all United States citizens. See this immediately. Right now we're reeling from this, but uh, Rob Dew, President Obama has been set up. He's been caught in a sting. You know, I have studied the whole birther, birth certificate story, and I've been on the fence. But the more I look at it, the more it is absolutely clear that a cover-up is going on. What are the big developments? Well, I had Jerome Corsi, investigative journalist, on my radio show today, and he said, Alex, I'm going to send you the World Net Daily article that I wrote back in February of this year where we had moles inside the 
Department of Health in Hawaii who told us that the birth certificate wasn't there, but the scuttlebutt was it was going to be added and that it would then be released. Then, three weeks before Obama came out in late April and released the birth certificate, Corsi has the emails, the correspondence, all of it on record, ailing out banks, signing statements, and lobbyists. There's no way they are this stupid. Uh, if they are this hubris-filled and arrogant and crazy and have put out the document that we're about to show you, then we're in even more trouble. In a way, I hope that this is some type of sick ploy, because if they are crazy enough to put this out, knowing that there are millions of people that are Photoshop experts, including people who have degrees in it, like my sister who has a degree in photography, and two people we have on staff that are Photoshop experts, they've all looked at it, it is mind-blowing. That's only the tip of the iceberg. That's what got the Photoshop community's attention online. There are thousands of sites right now going crazy, mainline ones saying this is obviously fake. On purpose. This is a horrible fake forgery on purpose. Understand, um, someone who has no understanding of how to research forgeries would... Something has to be done about it, and we shouldn't be talking about the birth certificate, but people love to talk about it. For instance, it's your first question. I guess uh, at a luncheon or at an interview, Governor Perry had mentioned that I said that I'm not a big believer, and I'm not. I mean, you know, people look at the hospital. There are no records that his mother was ever there. Uh, there are many other things that are really suspect. So, you know, out of after years of Hillary wanting it and McCain wanting it and everybody wanting it and I put the big pressure on, all of a sudden it appears, and people have real questions about the validity. Now, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about jobs. I want to talk about how to get this country great again, but I'm not a big fan. All right, well, uh, I actually, I'm, I'm convinced it's the real deal, so... Well, that's uh, you good. Know, I'm that, glad you are. I, uh, that's okay, and some people are and some people aren't, and, you know, I'm just not as easily convinced. Okay, the other thing, uh, you're very active uh, on uh, Twitter, and uh, you uh, just tweeted recently, does Barack Obama ever work? He's constantly, time I wrote him all down. <laughs> well, that's anyway, good. Gov Governor Rick Perry said that uh, he had dinner with you recently and that you do not believe the president's birth certificate is real or not. Is the governor correct that you don't believe it? I thought that you were satisfied. I'm not a major believer. I mean, I don't know how it just miraculously appeared, and we'll see what happens, but I'm never, I've never been a major believer. All of a sudden, after years and years, it was produced out of nowhere. Some people have serious, serious doubts as to its validity, and I frankly really want to get on to much more important subjects, although that's a very important one, because if, in fact, it's not 100%, he's not supposed to be the president of this country, which is a pretty important fact. But nevertheless, I want to talk about jobs. I want to talk about the economy. I want to talk about how China and OPEC and others are ripping us off. But I'm not a fan. Uh, I, thought when, I thought last April that it was finally put to rest with you. No, no, never to rest. I, I, I'm at a point where I say, look, the country is going to hell in a handbasket. And the birth certificate issue is far from dead. The majority of the United States citizens are not fools, and this conspiracy of silence perpetrated by the media is hurting their credibility. The currently released birth certificate on the Internet has been analyzed by forensic experts and has been found to be a forgery. Two and a half years now. I think it started during the campaign. And My friends, it is the 27th of April, 2011, and as the headline reads, uh, the newest Obama birth certificate that's been released by the White House has been altered in literally dozens of ways and it's been altered in ways that are so obvious that it makes the head spin. This had to have been done on purpose to accelerate this to debate. The White House obviously wants to make everything about the birth certificate and was he really from Hawaii or Kenya instead of his record of more wars, torture, 